it is important for us to share the good and the bad because the bad can really feel lonely if we don't. And if it goes too far, then we're, we're not honoring ourselves or our feelings. And we're really not letting people know us, like all sides of us. Welcome everyone to another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I'm Yelis Fass, your host and a fellow cardiac arrest survivor. If you're new to the podcast, well, first of all, welcome. Likely, it also means that you too are a cardiac arrest survivor. Now, I started this project and the podcast to help provide emotional support to cardiac arrest survivors by talking to other survivors in the hopes of making this journey less lonely and to learn from them on how they cope with this difficult situation. Now, in this episode, I had the pleasure to talk with Trish Pelps, a survivor who had her cardiac arrest while training at CrossFit. Some of the things we talk about are, of course, Trish's story. We also talk about self-blame, which honestly is a very interesting topic. Feeling like a failure, losing friends, feeling different, the best advice Trish would give to fellow survivors, and so much more. To find any resources mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes located in the description of this episode. This will take you to the website of the Heart Warrior Project, where you can also find other articles to help you live a better life after surviving a cardiac arrest. Having said all that, please enjoy this conversation with cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior, Trish Pelps. Trish, a warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. And yeah, thank you for taking the time to do this. You're welcome. I'm excited. So, um, how how did you end up being on this podcast? You know, where did this start? Like, when did you had your cardiac arrest? Um, who saved you? What's the story? So, I I experienced my cardiac arrest. It was four years ago in June. So, June 2018. Um, I was in what I thought was the best shape of my life. Uh, I had been doing CrossFit for like two years. Um, and I'd also been highly involved with dieting and exercising, working out, being active. Um, I took great pride in where I was physically. Um, I felt great. I had left for work because I would work out on my lunch break. So I left and drove out to CrossFit. I can remember driving out there. I remember I kind of felt a little bit off. Um, I had like a rapid heart rate, but I thought it was due to like, I tried a new pre-workout. So I was like, wow, man, because I had that flush skin and just that like, and I'm like, this will be fine as soon as I work out. So I got to, we were doing it with friends. We, my friend had a CrossFit gym in his garage. And so I went and was working out with him and his wife and another gal. And yeah, yeah, it was awesome. I got there, I changed, Mm. um, waited for him to get his shoes on. I talked a little trash. Um, the workout was deadlifts and burpees. So it was like five deadlifts at I think like 135 pounds and then 10 burpees. And then we had to do like five rounds of that. Um, I don't remember the workout. I remember like looking down at the bar at my feet and thinking this is going to suck. And then after that, there's nothing. After that, I, so that was like June 24th. Um, My next memory is July 4th. So I, um, my next memory after that was my husband's frustration Um, I was sitting in my living room talking to my husband and he was lecturing me about how he didn't know how many times he needed to tell me to write shit down in a notebook. I'm tired of having this conversation with you. Yeah. And that's, that's my first memory post. So to rewind, like what actually happened after I'd gathered and put the pieces together, um, I was at CrossFit 
we did our, our five deadlifts. I dropped the bar after my fifth one and I looked at my friends and said, I'm effing tired and I passed out. Um, my friends thought that I was joking and they made a comment back like, yeah, you're not going to get out of the burpees that easy because anyone who does CrossFit knows that burpees are the worst. So, um, when I didn't get back up or didn't say anything, uh, my coach said, I don't think she's okay. I think something's really wrong. And they started CPR and called, called, um, EMS and started getting that coming. So, um, they did about 20 minutes of CPR on me to this day. I just, yeah, 20 minutes because they were kind of out in the sticks and I live in a rural, a rural town. So it, it was 20 minutes of CPR, which I tell them it was the best CrossFit workout of their life. Right. <laughs> so, um, EMS came. It must be, but wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, EMS came and I was defibrillated three times before they could get a rhythm and I was transported to our local hospital here. Um, our hospital does not have like cardiac facilities. They're not a level two trauma or whatever. So they were in process of making arrangements for me to be transported to another hospital. Um, my husband is an EMT and a firefighter and was off duty that day. So they, my friends got a hold of him and he got to the hospital and ended up knowing the EMTs who had transported me and defibrillated me. And so they came out and told him that they did their best, but you know, with these type of things, the success of a cardiac arrest patient is not high. So they were basically giving my husband condolences in the waiting room. Um, he made arrangements to get my kids here or to the hospital. And they started discussing life lighting me to a hospital with better, better facilities for me, um, which they did. Uh, my kids did get to go back and see me before I was flown to a different hospital. Um, from what I hear from my kids, that was pretty traumatic. Um, after, for them? Yeah, yeah, for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I was I was relocated to another hospital, which was about 20 miles from where we live. And they sent me straight up to the cath lab. And they could not, like, my heart was fine. There wasn't anything wrong with my heart. Um, everything was functioning fine. They couldn't see any damage. Um, and then typical treatment, right? I was put into uh, an induced coma. They induced hypothermia for like four days. And um, they basically were trying to figure out what happened, how, why. Um, my blood work came back and I really zero potassium in my blood, in my blood system. So then they start talking, like, do you have a history of heart problems? No, I've never had anyone in my family who has just died. Um, so what we think, and so it's idiopathic, right? We don't know, but we're pretty sure that the cause was, as I said, I was very into my diet and I was very into CrossFit. I had been doing keto for three years. Um, but with that, I was not supplementing my potassium or my magnesium. Oh. So that lack of potassium, those electrolytes that you can only get from food, <laughs> um, caused my cardiac arrest, we think. So, That's what they think, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was on a potassium supplement for like three months. I was taking horse pills of potassium. And anytime I would scale back, my body wouldn't retain it. Uh, so that was a, a big thing. I had a kidney doctor, too, to make sure it wasn't my kidneys. And uh, I was getting blood draws every day. So, yeah, it was a, it was a, quite a, a thing. So um, I did quit doing keto. Um, I do tell people now whenever they're talking about keto, I'm like, Hey, it's great. You'll lose weight, you'll build muscle. You'll do all of these things, but make sure you know, you need to supplement these things. Like this happened to me. Um, in hindsight, looking back, there were signs 
that I had low potassium. Um, it sounds I, like what? Like I was tired all the time, all the time. Yeah. For somebody as active as I was, I shouldn't have been tired all the time, but I was. Right. And I was that person who I would drink coffee in the morning and then I would sip on an energy drink throughout mid morning to afternoon. And then at noon I'd take a pre-workout to go and do my CrossFit. And then I would drink another Mountain Dew between uh, that after work out till bedtime. And I slept with all of that caffeine and I could still sleep. Um, so I also learned that caffeine robs your body of potassium. The chemical compound. It? Yeah, it, it'll bind to the potassium and excrete it from your body. Okay. So any that I was getting was being taken from me. Yeah. Caffeine. So we did that. Um, that and then um, I'm trying to think what else was there. Um, yeah. So I think that was the, the biggest factor was just I thought I was healthy. I thought I was doing everything I needed to do to be healthy and to stick around, but I wasn't. So, yeah, crazy. Wow, such a big slap in the face in a way, right? Because you thought you were doing all the right things. Right, right. While it might have cost this. Yep, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I wake up from this event that I don't remember happening. And yeah. everybody is treating me different talking to me differently. My mom is over all the time, like cooking and cleaning. And um, I'm being told, like, I think the biggest thing for me is I was being told what I could and couldn't do. Like, you can't- Back then? Do, yeah. Like, I got up and I, I tried to live my normal life. No, you can't go back to work. Why? Why can't I go back to work? Because this happened to you, so I feel fine. I'm gonna go back to doing CrossFit. No, you can't go back to doing CrossFit. Well, why? Because this happened to you. We don't know what caused it. Um, I, it was just like overnight my life changed, right? I went from being an independent person to being told that everything I had done up to that point was wrong and was the reason that this traumatic event happened to me and my children and my husband and my mom and my sister. And it's like, oh, okay. Um, I lost my voice for a while. And so then it got to the point where I didn't trust myself to make decisions anymore. Mm. Like, or um, I think the biggest was like, I'm going to all these doctor's appointments, cardiac, my, my cardiologist, and I had a kidney specialist. And I'm going into these appointments with these people who have met me, right? But I don't know them. But they're talking to me like I do. And they're talking to me like I'm stupid because I can't figure out what they're saying. Like, I'm like, why is this happening? Like, what are you talking about? I have no memory of this. And you would, I, you know, in hindsight, you would think that they would be familiar with that, right? With like, hey, it takes a minute for the brain to catch up with what's going on. Um, I would say that probably caused like, I'm not gonna cry. Um, that was probably the most traumatic for me because I lost myself in all of it. Yeah, I lost my own voice to advocate for myself. And when I did try to, I was told it was wrong. No. Yeah, that, and I also had like, I, I was able to, this is crazy to me, I was able to um, check myself out of the hospital. Before I Check even yourself out. Yes. Yes. I was able to leave the hospital probably before I was ready because I was adamant that I needed to go home and get back to normal. I don't remember any of that. Like I don't remember any part in the hospital, but I was able to leave on my own free will. Um, they assigned a home health care nurse to come and I guess I I told that nurse that they needed to kick rocks and never come back. And they didn't. So I'm like, this is asinine because I can look back at 
videos and things that I've shared on social media and the memories pop up and I can watch those videos and I can be like, I am clearly not okay. Like I am clearly not okay. How was I able to not have any post care, right? None. So how was I able to leave? I got up in the middle of the night and ripped all of my IVs out of my arms and was telling the nurse to get away from me and give me my baby because that was the only logical explanation that I could be in the hospital was I had a child. Now give me my baby and let me go home. And still I was able to leave and I was able to, you know, send a nurse away. It's crazy to me. Like I was clearly not okay, but yeah, so there I was. I went right back to work. Um, you did. I did. I think you I did. took I took the week of the Fourth of July off off of work, uh -huh. and then I went back part time. So I was home from the hospital for one week, and then I went back to work part time. After that, my husband took more time off work than I did. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Wow. But, because I was, and then it, and then it spiraled into this thing where it was like, I'm, I have to be okay. I am okay. I have to prove to all of these people in my life that I am okay. And the more that I tried, the more I realized maybe I'm not okay, but I'd already been, you know, lying in my opinion. I was lying to everybody, making them believe that I was okay, that I had to keep being okay. Because... I already traumatized them enough, right? That was my fault. And I had to be okay. So I uh, was very lonely. Yeah. Being It that. is lonely. So, so much. Um, yeah. And then I guess I, I found a survivor's group on Facebook, which is where I saw this. And All right. Yeah. And I would reach out. From time to time, like when I was really struggling, and I would get responses from people, but it was like, just hang in there. I promise it gets better. I pro, you know, just hang in there. And I was like, why don't you guys just tell me how bad this sucked for you? Because I feel really alone. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now I participate, right? I see those new people and I'm like, yeah, I remember being where you were and everybody told me it gets better and it does. It really does. But it really sucks where you're at right now. Yeah. Uh, and then when you hear someone tell you that it gets better while you feel so shitty, that doesn't feel good, right? That, no. that you just can't believe that it will ever ever get better or you don't feel understood at all at that moment right it, it feels dismissive yeah yes it really does. Yeah, yeah. and then yeah. it's like so i guess my approach has been to try to give examples of where i was when i can relate like yeah i remember feeling that way like this happened to me and i get it but this is how i got through it like these are the steps that i took um for me, it took change, so much change. Um, and change is hard. It's so hard. Change is hard. Um, it took, I had to leave my job that I had been at, that I was really good at. I was, I, I was a marketing specialist for an insurance company. I had a really great boss. I had really great people in my office with me. But I didn't feel, mm -hmm. it was like the before and after, right? Like... I used to be better at this before, yeah. but now I really suck. Instead of being like, well, you know, your brain is really healing. Your body is really healing and you're probably doing okay with where you're at. But I had to, I had to give myself a ground zero for the new me because I truly feel like the person I was before my cardiac arrest and the person I am now are two different people. Yep. Completely. Same. Um, yep. I grieve her yep. a lot. I do. Um, but in other ways, I'm grateful for where I am now. So it's it's very bittersweet, I suppose. But I had to quit my job. I had to find something new, something in a field I'd never done before, 
with all new people who didn't know me, who didn't know who I was before so that I had the opportunity to build relationships as the new me. Um, and I guess when you're in a low spot, you find people who are in a low spot too. So I did have some friendships and as much as I love the ladies that were my friends at that time, it was like, um, if I wasn't having a bad day, one of the, one of them were right. It's that whole misery loves company. So if I wasn't having a bad day, they were having a bad day and we got to sit around and we got to share the negativity of our lives. Like, Oh, this is so bad. And you know, we hate the world. And you know, I went through that. I probably grieving anger. Um, so I had those friends to do that with me. And eventually when I realized that I couldn't live that way anymore and I decided that I needed help, I went to counseling and, um, started like, I didn't want to live that way anymore. So I went to counseling and when I started to do better, that friendship that was based on negativity deteriorated and, um, and it fell apart. I think that they were part of my life for a reason. Um, but we no longer associate with each other. And, um, I would say, so it's been, I've been about a year and a half since I started going to counseling. Um, okay. So the first three years you didn't, I break it, it up. Happened, right? Right. So I feel, I feel like my, my recovery has gone as the first year was I'm Okay. Right. Like I got yeah. to prove that a I'm, little bit of, yeah, yeah. Trying to get back to the normal yes, life that you yes. had, right? Yep. Getting back yes. to normal. Um, year two was like, Oh crap. I don't think I'm normal. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, year, year two was when I felt like I was like lying to the world. Right. Like I got to put on this face and it was like expectation versus reality. I have to be what these people expect me to be. And this is like the people who are closest to me in my life. My mom, my sister, my husband, my kids, my, my friends, the people who saved me. Like I have to pretend that I can keep up with these fast moving conversations. I have to pretend like I'm okay. You know, like I would get lost in conversations when there were multiple people, like I just couldn't keep up. And so- yeah, Cause how were you not feeling okay? Like, was it cognitively like just too much everything? Yes. Or how, yeah. I was that anxiety. I had anxiety that I'd never had before. Um, okay. I can remember it was my son's senior year he was playing football they made it to state and the state championship was in the Holt arena which is this big arena at the college near here and yeah. i can remember sitting in the stands and feeling so much anxiety that i could not enjoy the game i could not be present in the moment for my son because i was too worried about what was going on around me people coming up behind me things that never really I mean I think I had a little bit of anxiety before but it was magnified after for sure and large groups even now still I'm like I don't like this but I tolerate them a little better and I found tools that make them easier and I wonder if it's just because there's so much going on that cognitively I have a hard time differentiating conversations and understanding what I'm part of and what I'm not. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, but I do get anxious in groups. Yeah. Settings. Well, but our, our brains got damaged from this, right? And we don't know actually exactly how long it takes sometimes to heal it. Right. It can take, it will definitely take more than, than you might think, right? It takes right. longer than a month for sure. Might take a year, two years. Like Jasmine, the uh, previous person that I talked to on the podcast here, it took her two years before she remembered anything. Wow. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and I agree. I struggle with my short-term memory. I think it was kind of bad before, right? My short-term memory, it's aging. I'm, well, I just turned 40 this year. So um, that short-term memory is fading. But I know that it's like... I have tools now. Like I had to learn that there's no way I'm going to remember this like I used to. 
So now my phone is with me everywhere. If I schedule an appointment, it goes right into my phone. If I need just a few things from the store, I text myself. Like I send myself a text message because I know that I'm not going to remember three things when I get to the store. I'm lucky I remembered to get to the store sometimes. Like it's just, you know, um, but I accept that about me, right? Um, I think year two was just trying to live up to what I thought everyone expected of me or what I even expected of myself. Like you used to be able to do this. You need to be able to do this. Um, that was year two and year two was a lot of failure. I, I felt like I had these high expectations and I could not succeed no matter how hard I tried. Year two sucked. Year two. Yeah, that was the worst. Um, and it was probably about the end of year two when I was like, something has got to change. Like, I cannot keep living like this. I can't. Um, so that's when I started counseling. And that's kind of where I started. Like, I, I kind of distanced myself from everybody. Um, I kept my family close, my immediate family, my kids, my husband, because they were grieving and growing and they were on this ride with me. But as far as anyone else, my sister, um, my parents, my mom's extended family, aunts, uncles, um, even my close friends, uh, the ones who saved me, uh, I, I stopped going to CrossFit. I, um, I think that I also think like we were, ha we were struggling. I think that they were having a hard time. And so was I, I, I mean, I'm not sure. I, I don't know how it feels to save a friend's life. I don't know what trauma mm. that has. I don't, I don't know that they ever discussed it. I don't know what their journey has been. Um, have, have they ever talked with you about it? No, mm -mm. No. no, I think nah. no, I, when we did get together, uh, it was pretending like everything was the same, like everything was okay. And I wonder if that was part of where they were at. And so was I, um, mm. I grieve mm. that friendship. That was a good one, but it hasn't recovered. Maybe it will someday. I send them thank you cards every year on my zombie birthday. <laughs> um, and I still, I work with one of them and I'm, you know, we're, we're coworkers, but that friendship's not the same. I do miss those people a lot, yeah. but maybe someday, mm. you know, maybe they, someday exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, but I did, I, I kind of retreated into myself and I started yeah. to, I would say year three was acceptance for me. Yeah. Okay. Year three was like accepting that this happened to me and that this event changed me. It changed me fundamentally, like changed. I am changed because of this. How can that happen? How can one event change you as a person? I don't how can it not, honestly, yeah. like something as traumatic as this? Yeah. We all want to just return to the normal, right? Once we wake up. But it's something that we all, you, me, everyone almost just underestimates. What an impact this is on someone's life and the fact that you're doing all these things that's impressive yeah it's really impressive and we just don't get enough in a way credit for for what we do we try to just pick up life like it's like nothing changed right but <laughs> everything changed oh, right yeah everything everything yeah yeah it's it, it's crazy to think that that mm -hmm. it it does i'm I'm still very much who I was before. I mean, mm -hmm. there's still I still see her there sometimes. And when I do, when I get those glimpses of that person that I used to be, I was like, mm -hmm. I'm like, at a girl, there you are. Nice to yeah. see you. Um, mm. But she was selfish, right? Like, I, I look at it now in hindsight, and I, I was so wrapped up in how I looked. Or, you know, this image of what I thought I was going to look like if I could lift this much weight or if my, if the scale said this much that I didn't care how it affected anybody else. I mean, there were times that we would go out to dinner as a family and I couldn't eat because they didn't offer anything that was keto. 
And so my family suffered because of that life that I was living. And I was so worried about planning for that and making accommodations for that, that I wasn't really living. Wasn't really living. So this happened. It was a lesson. And now I, I will say I have a lot less patience with... A lot less? Yes. I'm less patient. Like um, if I feel like somebody is wasting my time, especially... Like, if I feel like you're wasting my time, you're going to know because I don't tolerate that. And I look at them, I'm like, time is valuable. That is the most valuable asset that we have in this world. And once it's spent, you can't get it back. You can't get a refund on time. So don't waste it. Don't waste my mm. time. And I, one of my mottos is if you're not happy, then change something, right? Life is too short to be anything but happy. And if, if it requires change, which sucks and is hard, it's worth it. The change is worth it. Um, so I am less patient with that. And, and it comes down to just, I don't have time to, to deal with your, whatever your issue is, whatever you're doing that's wasting my time. I don't have time for that. So I'm not going to do it. Um, I do, you know, a lot of times have to tolerate it but I make it known that I'm not impressed with people wasting my time which comes across as mean um I'm also <laughs> it can be yeah. it can it can I'm also very direct now which I wasn't yeah. before I don't sugarcoat things I don't fluff mm. them up um I'm just kind of like this is what I need from you or this was wrong I need you to fix it I'm not like oh I appreciate your effort you did such a great job and it looks so pretty no, well, it's like, dude, this is wrong. Please go fix it for me. Because again, it comes back to, I don't have time to waste beating around the bush. Like, and I appreciate when people are direct with me. I don't like to try to decipher what you mean. I want you to tell me what you need, tell me what you need from me and let me move forward. So, and I do like, I get told a lot that I am abrupt um, I get asked to um, soften the blow from time to time, but I now have learned that when I meet new people, I have to disclaimer like, hey, this is a little bit about me. I'm not a mean person. I'm just very direct. I'm blunt. I'm str And I appreciate it if you're that way back. Don't make me guess what you mean. Like, just tell me and I'll accept it. Um... That, How has this changed though your family situation, like with your kids and your husband? Um, my husband and I had to go through counseling, uh, marriage together, counseling yeah. together, um, because there was a little bit of a power struggle, right? Like he was trying, from my point of view, he, he was trying to tell me how to live my life and I was going to live my life the way that I wanted to live my life. Uh, Granted, it was coming from a good place, right? He wanted me to be healthy and to be here and to, you know, grow old together. All those things we had planned to do. And, he, you know, I, I didn't like being told what to do. And he didn't like that I wasn't listening to him. Right? <laughs> Yeah, I can see the interference happening there, right? Or the clash happening. Yeah. Because, of course, I mean, likely he did this for the best interests in you, right? To right. to help you heal. Mm -hmm. But I can uh, definitely see your side as well that, yeah, you don't... You just want to live life again, right? You don't want to, yeah, be told the whole time with someone that you have to do something. Yeah. Well, that and, you know, I have an EMT at home. So he sees, and they have had saves, right? He saved someone from a cardiac arrest. But he's also seen where they work their asses off to provide CPR all the way to the hospital. The patient is alive when they drop him off. They even get to see the patient go home. And then complications due to end organ failure or some of those other complications that do arise with a cardiac arrest survivor um, happen and they get maybe six months 
Um, I know for us right now, like the big countdown is to year five, right? Most of us who survive, what is it, like 65% or better, don't make it past the five-year mark. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, it could be correct, actually. Yes. Yeah, or even the first year or something. Yeah. Uh, there could be even already a big number of people who don't make it in the first year even. First yep. Year. Yeah. Yep. And, then, and I know five years is like the most loss, like from a survivor right. standpoint. So once you're past that year five mark, you you know, good rate of survival past that. So I told it, I, I am a, I'm a big birthday person. I feel like you, you only get one day that's yours, right? Mother's day you share with your mom and other moms and other dads. Same with father's day. The only day that is your day is your birthday. It's the day that you came into this world. And so I've always done it big for my family, my kids, my husband. Um, and I get two. <laughs> I get two yeah. birthdays. So you get this two year. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Five. So year five for me for we'll we'll party. Something and when is that happening? Because you're in year four now, right? I'm year I'm in year four, so June of twenty three will be five years for me. All right. Yeah. It's coming close though. I know, I know. We're almost there. We're like halfway mark. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's been for me, I think I'd like you, like our conversation earlier. It all my healing started when I decided to honor cardiac arrest survivor awareness month, October. Um I started sharing my story by just volunteering at CPR classes at our local hospital. And I went oh, in beautiful. and yeah, shared how CPR saved my life uh, and the importance of people knowing CPR. Uh, and then, so I did that my first year. And then this past year, I did a post every single day through the month of October from what it's like to be a cardiac arrest survivor. Um, how I did, you know, how I felt replaceable how it was so easy for my mom to jump in and parent my kids and how it was so easy to find a replacement in my job. And it was so easy for my friends to find new friends. And just there was a period where I felt replaceable. Um, is that true? Absolutely not. I know that I'm not, but it felt like it because, you know, my kids would go and ask my mom for things that they used to ask for me. So, yeah, those, I did that and, and, um, I just kind of embrace where I'm at and who I am and what I'm feeling and it's okay to be whatever it is that I am. Less than perfect. I struggle with my memory. I'm direct, sometimes mean, um, but I survived a big thing and yes, you did. That's yeah kind of where we are yeah how do you feel today actually today i feel um good uh i feel like i am a work in progress i am i'm still getting to know myself um i find that there are things that i used to love and i um go and i do them now and i'm like yeah that's not as great as i remembered it um, so I'm still learning who I am and, and meeting the person that I am now. And ex instead of fighting to be who I was, I accept those changes. Some of them are for the better. Um, my, I, I am learning to recognize trauma, my trauma, my trauma triggers. Um, those are like not being heard is one. Um, I don't know if you've experienced this, um, or not, but this past, so my, I have an implanted defibrillator because of sure, my cardiac arrest. Me too. Yeah. Um, yeah. so we picked a, the SICD because I am so young. I did not, my, my husband didn't want something that was going into my heart. He wanted one with the external wires on the outside. Oh, uh, wait. How does that look? S-I-C-D. 
Mm -hmm. So this one is implanted under my arm on my side. And oh, interesting. The, the oh. device is about the size of a hockey puck. So it's like this big underneath under my, your arm, under my left arm. Yeah. So it's like right here in this area. Yeah. So the ICD itself acts as one of the leads. So it's right on this side. And then I have a lead that runs under my breast and up through my, on the outside of yeah. my rib cage. And it's right on my sternum. So okay. that those two leads, right, the one in my sternum and the ICD will administer a shock. So we, um, that's what we selected or my husband did because, you know, obviously I couldn't make that decision for myself. And there was an issue, a recall through Boston Scientific that the battery was depleting quickly. So they um, issued, they sent a letter. I got the letter from Boston Scientific saying, hey, we found this problem. If it affects the batch of your ICD, you'll get a, you'll be contacted by your cardi cardiologist to do an update. And basically all I would have had to do is go in and they would have remotely connected to my device and done an update and I would have been fine. Well, my cardiologist never called me. So I assumed no news is good news. And went about my life until my annual cardiology visit where I was told that we were at end of life for the battery. Four years out. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Batteries at end of life. These, I don't know if you've heard or if they showed you, but your device will make a noise when the battery is low. Oh, no. Yeah. I didn't beeps. know that actually. Yeah. It beeps. So you'll hear it. That's freaky. It is. Hear it from, really from is. coming out of you. Yes. And so I like, you'll be sitting there and there's this beeping and I'm mm. like, what is that? It was me. It was me. Is it loud? Um, not like, not like fire alarm loud, but yeah. like, uh, maybe a notification on your cell phone loud. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was yeah crazy. Like 16 times a day, it will beep to alert you that, Hey, you probably need to get the batteries switched out. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta get um, yourself charged. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had to undergo a, a device switch this past, this, it was September I went. Yeah, this year then. Yeah, yeah, we went and did that. And in that process, I was dealing with my cardiologist who, I now have another one, but he he would not listen to me when I was telling him, like he wants me, he wanted me to have a pacemaker defibrillator um, and with leads implanted into my, into the chambers of my heart, you know, all of that. I know there are tons of people who have them. I know that they are great. Um, I just wasn't ready for that. I wanted to just like, I already have the pocket for this one. Like, let's just unplug the leads and plug a new one in and let's move on with our lives. And then when I'm older, we'll get something different. Um, he was not very kind and was very dismissive and made me feel like I wasn't being heard. And that was where I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is a trigger for me. This is, yeah. Um, I really had to persevere and be my own advocate. And I had to deal with that feeling of like, what if I'm making a wrong choice? because my wrong choices got me into this mess before. Um, so, so those, those were all, you know, I didn't realize what a trigger they were until I'm leaving the doctor's office in tears because he didn't hear what I was saying. He, mm. he dismissed me and I'm like, no, yeah. I know what happened. <laughs> yeah. So, so those are, I feel, I feel like you're somewhere still very harsh on yourself on what has happened to you. Some, yeah. Um, sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Because it's not per se your fault, right? I mean, you can, you can say that it was because you did that diet, but in another way, you thought that you were doing the right thing. Right, right. It's not like you were intentionally like, oh yeah, this is going to cause that, right? 
you had no idea that that was ever possible in a way. Right, right, right. Yeah, let me do this till my heart stops, please. Yes. Right, yeah. right. It was definitely... That was not your plan, right? <laughs> right, no. No, not yeah. at all. Not at all. Um, it's true. It is true. I need to work on that, for sure. Yeah. I'm not saying that, that it's easy, right? But I'm just hearing this and I would not say that it's your fault. Well, that's me, right? When I hear your story. Right, right. And I think you're just, um, it's making you suffer more by saying that it's, that you did it. Right. You didn't do that. You didn't do no. this. Not intentionally, for sure. No. No. And we don't even know that that's really what it was. It right. Been... Yeah. It happens. Um, and it might be the reason, but exactly. It might be also just something entirely different. Yep. Yeah, so that's, we're, we're growing. This year, we're growing. Of course, yeah. And then Every we'll year, see. it's another process, right? It is. It really is. Uh, um, I would say, so far, year three has been the best for me. Um, okay. It, it was acceptance. Um, yeah. I like who I am. I like who I am now. My family likes who I am now. And I'm working on building relationships with that extended family, um, mm -hmm. with my mom, my sister, I'm introducing myself to them yeah. and yeah. communicating. Right. Like, I am different and, you know, I manage their expectations in that way by just, Hey, here I am. Uh, I'm a little different. I, I don't like to, to do these things. Like I, I know I like to go to and do things, but I like to be able to leave when I'm ready. So if I need to go, I'm going to go and I'll talk yeah. to you guys later. So we're, that's where we're at. Yeah. We're, we're reintroducing. Yeah. And we had our whole life to spend time with this one person that we knew so well. And then all of a sudden that person dies and comes right. back, but you come back. Yeah. Again, as a, as a different person. Yeah. Because Everything changed, right? Everything yep. changed. Yep. Uh, Every so it's really confusing the first years. Like for me, it's still, I, I survived like two years now ago, my cardiac arrest. And I recognize a lot of things that you shared. Like I feel frustrated in things that I was able to do so easily three years ago. Two, like, and now I'm struggling and I hate it. I don't like it. Um, but I am... Yeah, figuring it out still too myself, who I am now. Um, but it's a real process. It's yeah. Yeah. It is. It is, and and it's okay. Like one making this event that happened to you, part of you, part of your journey, part of your story, helps give yourself that grace for not be you know for me like my memory is bad and i'll say something like oh yeah i forgot it's probably because of that time i died that one time right like it's like you remember that one time i died yeah that's why my memory sucks so those sort of things it gives you kind of that grace of like that forgiveness of yeah um yeah this is why <laughs> my memory sucks real bad I take a picture of where I park my car if I don't park it in the exact same space at Walmart because mm -hmm. I'm going to forget where I parked if I don't. So I'll take a picture before I go in the store so that I can come out and not look like an idiot wandering the parking lot. And that's because of that one time that I died for a minute. Yeah. Um, my kids do love that, though. They um, will say offhandedly, to people who know them, they'll say, yeah, yeah, like when my mom died. And then they'll wait for people overhearing to respond. And they're like, oh, no, she's fine now, but she did die briefly. And then I get to go to parent-teacher conference or whatever, and they're like, so your daughter said you died. That's a whole thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, I did, briefly. Momentarily, I took a break. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, what are uh, some tools actually that you learned for dealing with these memory issues? Um, I, I have I my. I mean, phone. using your agenda is a great tool. Yep. Like, well, I use my calendar app on my phone. Kellen. 
Um, I text myself lists and things. Um, I also like if my kids are like, Hey mom, uh, we're going to, you know, can I do this on this day or can I go do this? I I'll say yes or no. And I'll be like, but you're going to need to remind me when it gets closer because okay, yeah. I'm going to forget or we're going to need to put it in the calendar or here, let me add that right now. Um, with, I use my calendar app at work, like in Outlook, if I have someone who's taking vacation or things that I need to remember, I, I'll put it in a calendar app sure. with reminders. Uh, I text myself a lot. I like have my um, notepad lists in my phone. Like I always have to give myself a way. I call it, I leave breadcrumbs for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. and there's like three different methods that I use. It's either my calendar, my text messaging to myself, or I'll put it in my note app. But if I didn't leave myself a breadcrumb to remember in one of those places, then it must not have been something that I felt was important enough right. to, to remember. Yeah. So. And has it, gotten, has it become better through the years, like the memory issues? Um, I think so. Uh, I know that it helps by, like for me in conversations, the first few years, it was really hard for me to focus like and pay attention to the conversation because there was so much noise and stuff going on in my mind. It was so clouded and muddy and like just trying to make sense of just everything while trying to pay attention to a conversation. Um, so I found that as the years have gone by, it's easier for me to focus and stay engaged in a conversation. I do this by when somebody's talking, I will repeat kind of some of the important facts that they're saying, or I'll say, so what you're saying is this, right? To make sure that I understood correctly and being an active listener helps a lot in like those day-to-day -day things like with my husband for example if he's like hey this happened at work I'm picking up this shift he's also very good I put it on the calendar yes good job um, but he'll often say um, yeah I picked up that extra shift remember and I'll be like yeah for so-and-so because I repeated back to him in the conversation oh what's going on with this person it was like why did you need to pick up a shift for him and I make the conversation more memorable so that I can remember so I would say yes it's improved but also my ability to use tools has improved too so there's a lot less frustration there and I just find things and normally it's just so that I have peace of mind to feel better it's not necessarily that I need them but like the whole where I'm parking the car Taking that picture, I may not need it when I get out of the store, but if I do, I know it's there. And then I don't have yeah, to worry yeah. and get anxiety over it. Yeah. It's like your ICD, right? It's like right. the backup plan. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's funny because with that, I like I hated that dang thing. I told mm. the rep from, I guess, in my not-so-nice not so phase while I was in the hospital. I don't remember. But the Boston Scientific rep remembers me. Because when he came out after my surgery to see how I was doing, I told him what I thought of him in a not so nice way and basically told him that I knew my rights and he didn't have any right putting anything in my body without my permission. Uh, he's like, well, your husband gave us permission. But yeah, so he still remembers me. We, we had a nice chat this last time and I told him I did remember him this time. So... Yeah, but I was, I, I really, for a while, really hated that thing. And then when the battery was dying and it was like, I'm like, is it going to work? I don't know. Then there's that panic of like, what if I don't have this and I need it? So now it's my side piece and I love it. <laughs> it's part yeah. of it. Yeah, exactly. Right. After a while you start to accept it more and you also just see the benefit of having it even though it's sometimes annoying to have it still 
Hey, my apologies for interrupting the conversation. It will just take a moment. If you like the conversation so far and would like to support the Heart Warrior Project, check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow Heart Warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been, and well, still is in many ways. To show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that, that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the Heart Warrior Project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs and if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug, or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right, thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. Is there something that you do in moments when you feel like sad, lonely, uh, angry, you know, just having have, uh, having gone through all this or, you know, dealing with this ICD or, uh, yeah. Is there anything that helps you? I think just really... Um honoring that feeling, right? Um, and not trying to stifle it or like, cause sometimes, sometimes things just suck, right? And there's, yeah. there's nothing we can do to make it not suck. Um, and so I think for me, just admitting the fact that the situation sucks or this sucks, um, helps. I found that anytime I try to fight what's happening or not be accepting accepting of this of my situation, like if I am trying to change it or speed up the process or alter it in any way, it just makes it worse. But if I can just accept it for what it is, like okay, here's the hand that I am dealt. What's my next plan? What's my next play? I can't give this card back. I can't trade. I can't do any of this sidestepping. Like this is my hand and I have to deal with it. If I can do that, then I find that it's easier to move through it. Um, it's when I try to alter it in any way or fight against it that it gets worse. Um, so really for me, it's just, accepting that feeling or situation for what it is and evaluating the best path forward. And sometimes that's a conversation that I'm having with my husband on how we can best do it. And sometimes it's an internal dialogue of like, okay, well, there's really, this is outside of your control and you have to just kind of wait and let it play out and make the yeah, next yeah. right choice. Right. Yeah. But okay, I like that actually. Uh, it's really hard to do sometimes, right? But mm -hmm. just accepting what you're feeling and not being forceful on having to change it. But just like you said, it's okay if it sucks sometimes. It really is okay. And sometimes people around us try to be like cheerful or we try to be cheerful, but then we're kind of not accepting how we're feeling. Right. Well, mm -hmm. and we have to like, and this is this is the glass half full to that, right? we can't feel happy. Like happiness wouldn't exist without sadness, right? Joy wouldn't exist without pain. You have to, at some point that pendulum has to swing the other way. So you, you have, you can't really enjoy the rainbow if you don't suffer through the rain. That's true. Very true. Hmm. 
Is there still something today that you feel is difficult to um, communicate to the people around you or something that you still feel people around you don't always understand or don't understand at all? Um, I feel extreme, like this is the point of my, like I avoid this to, I'm the worst about it and I shouldn't be. And it's probably one of like the most frustrating things in my recovery for me is like, I really, really struggle to uh, be in places, relationships, moments with my mom, my dad, and my sister. Um, anything that involves spending time or like Christmas is coming up, right? Uh, we were doing Christmas at my sister's house. Um, and I have extreme anxiety about that because, and I don't know if it's, I know it's not their fault. Like, I know this is my stuff. This is my trauma. This is my changing. Um, but I, I don't feel like they know me. And I worry about what their expectations of me are. And, um, I know that I'm better than who I used to be. Um, as far as like the quality of person that I am, I feel like I've improved. Um, but they don't know this me. And I find that I am very guarded because at the beginning, they were the people I tried to communicate that to, right? They were the ones that I said, you know, I'm not the same. And I feel different and there's something wrong with me. That's what I would say. There's something wrong with me. And my mom would say, there's nothing wrong with you. Just give it time. Um, yeah, mom, there is like, you know, um, so that like, it's like, I shouldn't feel this way. Right. I shouldn't feel like a stranger to my mom. I shouldn't, these people who mean so much to me, I shouldn't feel this way, but I do. And it's, it is what it is. Um, I'm working on reintroducing myself to them uh, in small doses because it can be overwhelming. Uh, but it's, I, yeah, that's, that's my current struggle. Because I do want a close relationship with my mom and my sister and my dad. I don't want to regret not having one. Because, you know, you never want regrets. But that's the one. What could they do to help you, like, um, yeah, uh, meet this new person? Um, what could they do that could really help you? move closer to them again? Um, I think that they are trying, like my sister and I have been really good. We, we try to have lunch together once a month. So okay, yeah. we'll go and we'll have lunch and we'll talk and we'll listen and we'll, we'll, um, have those conversations and it's a good way of getting to know one another. Right. And sharing. And so I do feel like my relationship with my sister is growing. Um, uh, I don't know. As far as like, I struggle mostly with my mom because of she, she is kind of in just a negative space in her life right now. Uh, okay. I don't know. So she's if, dealing with her own things actually. Yes. Too. Yes. And, and yeah. that's okay. And you know, that's, yeah. that's hers. And I'm here to help and listen, but also, um, it's really a not, it's not about things that I can change or do, or it's not about me. So, I mean, hers is all kind of political driven politics and 
COVID and, you know, and I'm like, yeah, no, there are, there are bigger things in life than stressing out about something you have no control over. So, um, I think my, my mom could focus more on her relationships that she does have control over and really listen and what I mean by really listen is like actually hear what people are saying and take their words and like act on them or make change or I'm, I just think when you hear someone and you listen, it's different than hearing them, right? So if you're listening, yes, you're hearing the words that they're saying, but if you're actually hearing them, you're, you're they mean something. You want to take action or you want to build upon the conversation. And I don't feel mm. like that's something that is happening. Um, with you? With me. And I can only speak yeah. from my personal experience, like with me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I'm hesitant to share. Like we get, it gets back to like, I'm not going to waste my time building a relationship with you if you're not hearing what I'm saying, if you're not accepting what I'm saying, if you're not willing to walk this road with me, then why Have you share this I... to her? Um, not for a while. Um, I, her and I did have some pretty heated discussions. Um, and there was a period of time where I didn't talk to her for a long time, like probably six months. Um, and then we had our discussion and I said, look, I'm different. Well, how are you different? I don't know. <laughs> I just know that I am. I'm, I'm figuring that out. And I, I tell her, you know, there may be things that I loved to do before and I get there and I don't. And yeah, I'm just thinking now, like it must be really confusing for the people around us, right? Because we look the same. Yeah. There's nothing physically different about us, right? And so then if you say like, yeah, I don't feel the same, which I I don't feel the same either. But that's really hard to connect them where you just look the same like you did yeah. before this happens. Um, and you I, sound the same. It, you laugh yeah. the same. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is a mother who has, you know, watched me grow for the last 40 years. And I'm telling her mom, I'm different. Right. And well, how yeah, are you different? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, mm. you know, I, in a lot of ways and I'm the same in a lot of ways. And it's just kind of, I guess, I don't know how much of that is my own expectation or a perceived, right? That I think that she expects me to be this way, right? I don't know, but I've closed off that part to heal in other areas that now I'm starting to open that door and experience that. And really it's about communication and setting boundaries. Right. And, and having that discussion of this is, I'm comfortable up to this point. And then past this point, we're, we're going to take some time and regroup. So, I mean, I am stepping out of my comfort zone. Um, I would say the last couple of years, it's been a, a hard no for things that I didn't want to do, like family reunions and gatherings and things like that. And I've committed to, we'll, I'll, we'll be doing the family reunion this year. And um, although Christmas, I don't like to have people at my house only, and it's not because I don't like to have people over. It's because I want to be able to leave the situation if it becomes uncomfortable. Sure. Um, yeah. So it's not that like... It's be harder I, in your own house then, right? Yeah. I'm like, I, I, yeah. I don't want you to come over because I don't want to be a jerk and be like, y'all got to go. I'll just leave gracefully, right? When I'm ready. And I like being able to do that. Like that is how I can feel comfortable. And most times I'll sit and I'll stay and I'll visit and I'll have a great time. But it's being able to give myself that exit when I need it. Because I know that emotionally for me, things are heightened when maybe it's not that big of a deal, but it feels like it to me. And instead of making a big deal out of something that's probably nothing, I can exit the situation and process it on my own because my feelings 
do not have to affect everybody else. Like they're my feelings. I'm I'm an adult. I can I can manage those. But if I'm in a situation too long, I'm I'm likely to yeah. have those spew onto others and I try not to. Yeah, setting those boundaries and knowing those boundaries, but also really being okay, you know, that you have to set boundaries. It is a learning process to do it, but the more you do it, uh, yeah, the more help, the more you're going to be there for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's 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 hard to set those boundaries, though, uh, but super important, super yeah. important. Well, it's hard to have those conversations, right? Because yeah. when you're setting a boundary, then you have to answer the why. And sometimes the why is, I don't know. I don't know why, I just know that. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't like this feeling. It's leading into anxiety. It's maybe a little close to a trauma. I, I don't know because I haven't had time to assess that is generally my, I don't know right now, but when I have an answer for you, I'll tell you, like I'll, yeah. I'll explain that. But it's really just about articulating and, and being, I mean, most, I don't know for you, but for me, it's hard to have conversations about the not good feelings, right? It's hard to have those conversations about anything that's not happy or good. Like, because when you do, people want to just rush in and fix it or, or say, or dismiss it. Like, Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Don't worry about it. Or it'll get better. Or, and it's like, no, this, this, it may not be a big deal to you, but to me, it is a big deal. Um, and I find that even myself, like when people are sharing their feelings with me, the not good ones, I try, I, I've noticed like, it's just our nature to tell someone it'll be okay or to try to fix yeah, it yeah. for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I try to be very aware when somebody's having a hard time to instead of trying to fix the question or the feeling to ask a question like is there something that I can do to help you move through this like what do you need from me as your mom or as your friend or as your wife like what what can I do to help you and sometimes it's nothing like there's nothing you can do for me right now okay well I'm here if you need me it sucks that you're going through this right now like that would really suck I can empathize with you, um, but I try not to dismiss or downplay their feelings. Um, and I think by doing that, we're teaching people how to respond to us, right? By being that example, hopefully. I mean, one can only hope. Yeah. But you're correct. I also often don't like talking about this. You know, if people ask me, how are you doing? I find it such a challenging question these days because... Uh, I just answered like, yeah, I'm okay. But if I have to honestly answer it, then it's, yeah, um, it's a bit more of a tricky question to answer. Uh, but I just don't like answering it so much when I am being honest, because people don't often know how to respond. And like you said, they kind of try to come with a solution or be like, yeah, it's going to be fine, you know, or, or what did you learn from it? Or it just, yeah, without... It, what we often need is not an answer, but just someone who listens and who tries to just understand, right? And, and it's just there. Them, right? Just accept me yes. on my bad days. Just just yeah. know that I'm having a bad day and, and accept me and love me for it. Because yeah. we all have bad days, not just cardiac arrest survivors. Like maybe we have more than others. Maybe <laughs> we don't. Yeah. But just, you know, I'm not going to run away just because you're having a bad day. Or just because you're struggling with this. Like, I still love and support you. What can I do to help? Nothing? Okay, yeah. well, do you want to get your mind off of it? Do you want to go do something? Do you want to sit here and feel sorry for yourself? Like, what do you want to do? Um, but I think that it is important when we're not having a good day. Like, my my response when I'm I'm in my feelings is I retreat into myself internally. So I shut off all the garbage around me. And I just really retreat. So I'm not as as talkative. And I just kind of shut people out so I can process internally what I'm going through. 
Um, and people notice this. Like my coworkers are like, you're not okay. I am fine. I am good. I just need some time. Um, but then I'll come out of it. I'll figure it out and I'll come out and then I can have the conversation. But a lot of it is I'm feeling something and I don't know why I'm feeling it. Like I'm feeling this, but why? And I, once I figure out why or the cause, the root and can process through it, then I can have that conversation. But it's when I'm in the middle of it, I'm like, I don't really know. Like, I'm going to lose my shit and I don't want it to be on you. Like, I don't want you to be a casualty of my feelings. So just give me some time to process and then we can discuss it. But I think it is important for us to share the good and the bad because the bad can really feel lonely if we don't. And if it goes too far, then we're, we're not honoring ourselves or our feelings. And we're really not letting people know us, like all sides of us. So yeah. it's, it's hard, though. It's a roller coaster, right? It's a real roller coaster. It is. It is. Yeah. But it does get better. Um, I can say, looking back, um, it does get better. Uh, I know that that's hard to hear. And I know how frustrated I felt when people would tell me to just hang in there. It gets better. Um, I think the more we get to know ourselves and the more we honor and advocate for ourselves, the better it gets. Mm. Trish, can I ask you one last question? Sure. Yeah. Um, you actually were sharing already quite uh, some of what I'm actually going to ask now. But uh, is there like a best last tip that you would like to share to anyone listening who also is a survivor? Or any last words that you just want a survivor listening to know? Ah. <sighs> When you feel alone, you're really not. Um, it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to admit that. Um, yeah. I would say that the more honest you are with yourself about how you feel um, and those changes that you're, you're feeling, um, the more honest you are with yourself and the more you try to embrace that, the easier it will be to heal. Um, I think if I could go back and change anything that I did, it would be to, I would go back and I would change that part of me that thought I just needed to get back to normal. I wish that I would have said, I just need to learn who I am now. Right. Um, right. And I think that if I had done that, I think that where I'm at with, my mom and my sister and my dad and those, those relationships that I'm struggling with right now. I think that if I had started that mindset sooner, it would have been so much easier, um, for me and for them mm. had I done that. So uh, I think that that's like the best advice I can give is just really honor yourself and how you're feeling and be honest and truthful in that. Because it's not wrong and it's not something to be ashamed of. Like, I mean, if anything, we should be proud of the fact that we survived something that most people don't. For whatever reason, we're here and we're supposed to be. That's uh, some good last words um, to end this conversation. Trish, thank you just, you know, so much. There's so much more, of course, that we could have kept talking about um, and maybe for a next round at some point, right? But thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing your journey and uh, sharing some advice and tips to survivors listening. Well, thank you so much. And I'm so thankful that you're doing this. I appreciate it so much because it's important that people know that they're not alone, but it's also important for people who haven't experience this but maybe know someone who has to really know like what we're going through and maybe be just be able to be there for somebody in a different way yeah to understand like uh, the journey a little bit of what yep. we're going through yep yeah. 
Yep, and hopefully we help others heal. And that concludes yet another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I hope you found some support from this conversation with Trish Pelps and me. Hopefully you gathered some tips, advice or lessons to help you on your journey. Now to find any of the resources mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes located in the description of this episode. Also, if you're looking for more inspirational stories, then definitely listen to the other episodes on the podcast or uh, check out the website of the Heart Warrior Project where additional articles uh, can be found to help you live a better life after surviving a cardiac arrest. Having said that, this is your host, Yelis Vaas, signing off. Before you go, i uh, just like to remind you of the Heart Warrior t-shirts and mugs I've created together with an illustrator. If you're looking for a fitting t-shirt or mug that will not only show the battle you fought and are still fighting, but also something for yourself to wear and use that will make you feel empowered, these t-shirts and mugs will be a great addition to your life. It certainly has been true for me. Additionally, you will also be supporting the Heart Warrior project which will help me to keep this project running. Now, if the t-shirts or mug doesn't speak to you, but you want to support the project, we also accept donations. You can find more info about all this by going to the description of this episode. There you can find a link to where you can order the t-shirts and mugs, as well as other ways to support this project. Or you can go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find this information.